Good afternoon, this is Jay Waters. I'm with the Voices of Freedom Project and the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today is 9 November 2019. We're down in Yorktown, Virginia, and it's my pleasure I get the opportunity to interview Mr. Don Klein. Don, if you could, for the camera, just uh, give us your full name and, and where were you born? Full name is Darrell Donovan Klein, Jr. I go by uh, Don, which is a shortened version of my middle name. Uh, from uh, born in, in Shelby, Ohio, uh, June 1955. Um, okay, Shelby, Ohio, 1955. Okay, and uh, what major wars or conflict did you participate in? Uh, primarily uh, Operation Desert Shield, uh, Desert Storm. Um, I wasn't in theater. I supplied troops and supplies, logistics. Uh, to the forces that did deploy. Uh, also, uh, I was involved in enforcing the uh, no-fly zone over Iraq at, uh, post uh, ODS, um, and uh, the uh, invasion of Panama. I okay. supported uh, that as well uh, when I was with the Seabees. Um, uh, there wasn't a conflict when I was on First tour of duty was on a submarine, there was no conflict. Uh, could have been a conflict, uh, but uh, uh, there were some Cold War activities I participated in as a, as a sailor on a submarine. Okay, yeah, and we'll ask a lot of follow-up questions on those. And uh, which branch of service were you in? Uh, United States Navy. Okay. Uh, entered the Navy through the uh, Navy ROTC program. Um, out of high school, I probably did not have the, the means to go to college even though I wanted to go to college. Uh, so I applied uh, uh, various service academies as well as the ROTC program and I was accepted into the ROTC program uh, and attended Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Okay. 1973 to 1977. Excellent. And I was going to ask you that but you already answered one of the future questions but that's good. Um, but so, speaking of your of your family, uh, did you have any any relatives, parents, or brothers, sisters, uncles that had served in the military? And if so, who, who were those folks? And, and what I, did they do? I did. Uh, my uh, father served in the United States Navy, approximately 1951 to 1953 time frame. Um, I did have an uncle that served uh, uh, in World War II uh, in the United States Army. Not sure what he did uh, in the Army. Uh, wasn't old enough to be that inquisitive at the time to ask him, but yeah. uh, he did serve. Uh, my grandfather served in the United States Army in World War I in oh, France. Wow. Yeah. Uh, reportedly, he was a, uh, I'm still doing research on him, but reportedly he was an ambulance driver on, oh, wow. the, on, the, on the front uh, uh, serving in France. Wow, okay. Now that's, that's, that's fascinating, a lot of, lot of history there. Um, Switching gears a little bit, think back to uh, September 11th, 2001 and the attack on America. Can you tell us where you were that day and kind of what, what happened on that day? I, I can. It was, uh, uh, it was a beautiful day. I do remember that. Clear blue skies, perfect fall day. Um, I was working at the uh, Navy Expeditionary Logistics Support Force as a deputy commander there. Uh, it's located a few miles away from here, actually. Okay. It's in uh, uh, Cheetah Man X on the Naval Weapons Station, uh, probably about seven or eight miles from here. Uh, I was with my staff that morning, and uh, I had a, uh, one of my officers come into my office and says, hey, boss, you need to come down and take a look at this. Uh, he had the uh, CNN on uh, TV in the conference room and uh, we proceeded to, to watch what was happening that day. Um, it was rough watching it, and the, the, uh, the officers I was with, we, we talked about what was happening, and, and initially there were some comments that have, could have been just an accident, a plane just yeah. misflew and all that stuff that we all knew. We all knew that it was a terrorist attack. Even as quickly as the, fir the first, first, wow, first half hour uh, of seeing what was going on, uh, it was apparent to us that things were going to 
ramp up quickly. Right. We are in war. Did did your facility um, go through any additional security or lockdown procedures or alerts or anything? Uh, as as a tenant on the Naval Weapons Station, uh, we really kind of relied on them for the force protection uh, actions. Uh, though we were. Uh, Definitely involved with the weapon station sure. on improving our, uh, hardening our, our status, you know, front gates and uh, surveillance and, and things like that. Um, one thing I do remember quite well, I actually, myself and the family lived on the Naval Weapon Station in housing. And I remember very clearly, uh, at, the, at the time there was, there was uh, I think, Langley was sending F-15s, I think, up to the D.C. area. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Up to the D.C. area, uh, first thing in the morning, and then they come back at night. So I'll, I clearly remember them flying up the York River, which is right outside where I live, yeah. going up to D.C. for patrolling uh, missions uh, throughout the day, and then about, I don't know, 1,600, 1,700, 1,800 at night, um, you could hear them come back, yeah. come back home. And they did that for at least, I'm thinking two to three weeks. Yeah. It was just, uh, it was just something I, I'll never forget that. Yeah, what was, it? yeah, that's interesting. Just the, what was the mood on the base and, and within your, your command, like for the next week? Were the routines different, extra hours or extra planning? Yeah, yes, because uh, uh, we were, uh, our units uh, were written into the plans. Um, I won't say what plans, but they were written into the plans. Uh, our our uh, personnel will be used um, quickly, early, uh, for offloading uh, supplies, yeah. uh, cargo handling, um, you know, port operations, and things of that okay. nature. And so, yeah, we were uh, we were gearing up. We were uh, brushing up on what we. Uh, could be expected to do, um, and, uh, and alerting, alerting our folks to be ready. And we had a, a priority list of, of folks that we were going to call on first, and uh, we let them know so they could prepare themselves. Okay. Um, and I think you kind of already answered this, but the question was about why did you enter the, the military service? Um, did you want to expand on that at all? Or? Yeah, yeah I, I, I will, because it was, uh, my dad influenced me. i just put it that way. Um, he, he had been in the Navy for uh, two years, at least two years active duty, uh, some reserve time following that. And I remember as a young kid, uh, 12 years old maybe, 11 or 12 years old, uh, him saying, think about going into the Navy at some point, you know, and, and just kind of, kind of registered with me and uh, kept stayed with me through high school and then uh, like I said I applied for the service academies and whatnot and then uh, uh, before I got accepted I had to have a physical uh, uh, you know thorough middle military uh, examination uh, pre entrance examination and so my dad took me down uh, it was in Columbus Ohio sure. he, he, he took me down there I had to be interviewed I had paperwork to fill out uh, and and he stayed with me through that uh, through that initial process. I said, this is this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. And uh, fortunately, I was able to get the uh, ROTC scholarship, yeah. uh, which was able to uh, help me um, uh, reach my my goal, become a, a U.S. Navy commissioned officer. Well, yeah. So you so you finished the ROTC. So then. Um Commissioned as a ensign, ensign correct? Yeah, ensign. so the, 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 the lowest level of, of the officer ranks. Yes. And then, um, where did you go for your initial training? Initially, um, I became uh, what the Navy calls a supply corps officer. Uh, it's, uh, it, lack of a better term, it's like a the business manager or logistics manager for the for the Navy. Uh, supply, logistics, uh, transportation, contracting, purchasing, those types of things, which was what I was interested in also. And so I was accepted into the Supply Corps uh, program. Um, so my first uh, 
after graduating from college and becoming uh, commissioned, I was sent to Athens, Georgia, where the Navy had their Supply Corps school. Okay. Uh, I had s about six months of training there. Sounds like a lot. Uh, didn't seem like a lot at the time. Went yeah. by pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, at the tail end of it, uh, I chose. You, you, at the end of it, you could choose what platform, what Navy platform you would uh, want to serve on for your first tour in the fleet. I thought submarine sounded interesting, uh, so I signed up for the uh, submarine program, and uh, there was an additional like two months of specific core uh, studies on uh, submarine uh, supply management. Uh, following that, I went to submarine school in, in uh, Groton, Connecticut, okay. yeah. uh, New London, Navy base in New London. Uh, Unfortunately, it was in the middle of the winter. Uh, reported in January, and uh, it was it was cold. You know, they do through all the damage control training, and the water comes off of the, the Thames River. Comes, and it's, it was just uh, an experience. Yeah. But three months of submarine school, and uh, following that, uh, my submarine happened to be state uh, home ported in Groton, Connecticut. Okay. Uh, uh, and so I uh, just went down the pier and reported aboard after uh, submarine school. So I had nine months of training before I went to my first duty station, which was not totally typical, but uh, it was needed. It was needed. Um, yeah. Reported aboard in first of April 1978. Okay. And uh, as soon as I got on board, uh, notified that, hey, we're changing home ports. So we, uh, submarine, uh, uh, changed home ports from Groton, Connecticut to San Diego, California. Oh, wow. Uh, which required us to go uh, offload, the, offload the weapons we had on board the submarine in uh, Bayonne, New, Bayonne, New Jersey, because they weren't allowed to be carried through the Panama Canal. Uh, so we went down through the Panama Canal and changed show ports to San Diego. So that was my first uh, uh, logistics experience. Uh, learned a lot along the way. Um, and then shortly after we got to San Diego, we had workups because we were deploying to the Western Pacific. For the first, that submarine was the first time it had gone to the Western Pacific. Uh, Pacific. Oh, wow. Well, for a non-Navy uh, guy or for the audience, so, so to go from Groton, Connecticut, to San Diego in a submarine. How, I mean, how long does that take? It took uh, approximately uh, 30 to 40 days, something like that, because we had some stops along the yeah. way. I mean, the, the Navy was uh, nice enough to let us stop, uh, it, you know, like for example, Curacao. Uh, that was island uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, and we took our time. Uh, getting get out there. Going through the Panama Canal was interesting because you're on the surface most of the, oh, wow. yeah. about the whole time. Uh, we had uh, uh, a mail boat come out and meet yeah. us uh, in yeah. the middle of the lake as we're going before we hit the locks and we got our mail through the mail over the side which is not very typical either. And <laughs> my cooks uh, my cooks got some grills and put them up on the back of the submarine yeah. and we had uh, we grilled steaks on the yeah. back of the deck of the submarines we're going through the Panama Canal so it was, that was an interesting wow. experience yeah and this is your first assignment when well, yeah, there's right. a supply guy you're probably in charge of the, the mail the food and all, all that kind yes, of stuff right absolutely I mean it's yes. not just yes it's it's broadly focused right right so you know 34 30 to 45 days it took us to get out to San Diego and uh -huh. And everybody had to get settled in and uh, get their cars, uh, get get some housing, things like that. So it was it was a busy summer because, uh, like I said, we had to, we got there in June, early June. Uh, we're going to deploy to the Western Pacific in September. Sounds like a lot of time. No, it's not. It's not. It's not a lot of time. I found out. I was uh, worked a lot of long hours. Uh, uh, getting parts on board, uh, uh, mission-specific things that we didn't have that we needed, um, had to plan for the food because we're going to have, uh, I had over 120 sailors to feed mm -hmm. and we're going to be out to sea for 90 days. Yeah. I was 23 years old. That was a big task. <laughs> that was a daunting 
yeah. task. But uh, we're able to uh, do the right planning, uh, expedited the parts, got them on board, um, and uh, we deployed for three months, 90 days, submerged. Yeah. Well, and I can, as an Army guy, I mean, we would just stick stuff in the warehouse. For a sub, the Submariner guy you're, and the supply guy, you've got to utilize every nook and cranny and inch of we, space. Yes, sir, we did. Uh, yeah. You have to. Uh, uh, if you're, feed, you're feeding four meals a day for 120 sailors for nine months, or for three months, excuse me, mm -hmm. 90 days, three months. Yeah. That's that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of chow. Wow. Well, we may come back to that. I'm just I'm always intrigued about the submarines. But l let's just jump forward a little bit to um, from the combat times. It sounds like that Desert Storm, Desert Shield would be your first one, and then um, or was it Pat with Panama? Would Panama would be first? I actually, think, actually right? uh, the submarine was my first, but, was my first assignment. Yeah, but in, as far as like combat. Uh, yeah, I I, uh, I would say um, the submarine tour. All, all I can all I can say, without getting in, into a classified scenario, is we did some in those ninety days that we were to, first ninety days we were deployed. We did some things that directly related to strategic national interest. Cool. That's all I can say. Um, but it, it was extremely important to, to, to the nation. Um, after that 90 days, uh, we came uh, off, <clears throat> off the mission and had several stops. We went to Guam, went to the Philippines. Uh, a couple times we went to, actually we made a couple stops in uh, Hong Kong. And, uh, and then we were, actually gearing up to go to Australia for another mm, port visit. Yeah. It sounded like a good time, didn't it? Well, as we were going to Australia, we were about halfway there, urgent message, go back to the Philippines, load out food, supplies, whatever, and go here. I, I, I won't tell you where, sure. but it was another mission of strategic national importance right um, uh, coincidentally I'll, I'll say just one thing and it's not classified but it was it was around it was the same time frame that the Shah of Iran was deposed yeah. and uh, had to leave and the embassy uh, people were taken hostage right yeah I remember those days that's that's all I'll, I'll say about that so we we're uh, on station on that mission for about 60 days, and uh, we're, we're taken off. Um, and at that point, we'd been out to sea six to seven months, and we headed back to uh, the home port. But I have one thing I want to share about about that experience in the submarine. I was a, I was a diving officer. I was, okay. I was one of my watch uh, duties. Um, a diving officer is responsible for maintaining the depth of the submarine. Okay. If, if we're ordered 200 feet, I keep it at 200 feet. If we're ordered to come up to 100, I come up to 100, keep it level and stay steady. One night I was on watch, um, and uh, we had a casualty back aft. That's all I'll say is back aft. Um, we had an electrical fire, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, fires on submarines are very uh, serious things, and uh, <clears throat> so the officer to deck ordered me to bring the submarine up so that we could, I could put out the snorkel mast, we could induct fresh air sure. into the submarine and expel any any bad air. So I was in, I was in the process of doing that. I, I, I put the uh, put the submarine at an up angle and was going to head up to, uh, to uh, snorkel depth and I uh, had my uh, planesmen, two of them on each side are uh, fair water planes, uh, stern planes, full rise position and uh, I'm looking at my depth gauge and it's not going anywhere. Well Don Klein was getting pretty concerned. Here I am, I got the, I got the boat at an up angle and we're not going anywhere. 
holy moly. Uh, and I'm, we're starting to, I was in the control room, and you're starting to smell smoke come up in the control room. So, uh, <clears throat> very concerned. And finally, <clears throat> after a few minutes, uh, I was starting to pump water out to see if that would lighten us up and get us up. After a while, we felt a, the boat fell a shutter, and I realized what happened. We had broached. The bow had come up out of the water, and the, uh, uh, the sail had come up out of the water, and we settled back down. Uh -huh. What had happened was the electrical fire had put out, I had a depth gauge I was watching. It was powered by the uh, yeah. electrical system that was put out by that fire. And so my gauge did, it stuck yeah. in, in like okay. 200, 300 feet, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Uh, so I broached the submarine, which is a big no-no, uh, but got it settled back down, got it steady, got snorkel mast out, started bringing in some of that fresh salt water air um, and, and helped expel the, uh, yeah. the fire, the smoke. And were the guys in the back, were they okay? Or how, yeah, how they, they were. There, they was, were, there was no injuries. We had a fire that was uh, they put out fairly, okay. fairly quickly. Okay. My commanding officer come up, come, came up to the control room after things were all under control, and he looked at me. I thought he was going to fire me, relieve me from uh, watch. But he said, "Don, do you know what you just did?" I said, "Yes, sir, I did." I said, "There's a there's a uh, there's a, a depth gauge that I could have looked at that sense just sense sea pressure." So I would ah, okay. okay, it was directly connected to sea pressure, so I could have seen roughly wh what my depth was, but I would just focused on my digital depth gauge. Yeah, but that's a, that's a learning opportunity as well. Right, so and that's, what, that's, a, that's what the CO said. He, he, he didn't, <laughs> he, great man. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Bill Hicks, uh, uh, he, he let me continue my watch, which I appreciated. Yeah. Uh, didn't chew me out yeah. in front of my, my Shipmates. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that's it was, good. It was a good experience. Well, let's just jump around a little bit because I understand from talking to you before in the notes that you then participated uh, in the future with the Desert Storm and Desert Shield opportunities. Yes. So just kind of yes. tell us what your unit was, yeah. what your duties were, what was going yeah. on at that time period. Um, actually, uh, I was finishing up a uh, three year tour with a, a Naval Mobile Construction Battalion, five ported out of uh, Port Moinimi, and I got transferred. Is that, I'm sorry, is that Hawaii? Port Moinimi, California. California, okay. Ventura County. <clears throat> and I transferred in July 1990. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait like two weeks after I left. Yeah. So, and my battalion, if I had still been with them, they deployed. Yeah. They deployed to uh, Saudi Arabia up near the Kuwait border. So I just missed that <clears throat> uh, opportunity to deploy with them. I even asked them, uh, hey, do you guys, uh, you guys want me to come back? And they said, no, I think, Don, we appreciate it. We think we've got things under yeah. control. Uh, so I was uh, sent to a, uh, actually a Navy Reserve Headquarters Command in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, so there I mobilized, helped mobilize about 600 um, sailors from the upper Midwest that deployed to various locations, including theater, um, uh, during that, that conflict. And what kind of things did you do with the, the mobilized uh, sailors to get them ready for deployment? We called them into base. You know, you got reserve centers all over the Upper Midwest. You called them into reserve centers. Um, you, you process them back on active duty uh, or to active duty. Um, make sure their immunizations are up to date. Uh, shots, uh, uh, uniforms. You got the uniforms that are required. Um, Obviously, a lot of paperwork, medical examinations uh, had to be done. So it was a, it was an effort to uh, to get them up and ready to, to deploy. What, what was your rank at, at this time? I had just made commander, commander in the Navy at that point. Okay. Okay. And then uh, you mentioned earlier too that you participated in an operation called Desert Fox. Desert Fox. 
that was uh, <clears throat> towards the end of my career. I actually took my family. We spent two years in Bahrain. Okay. At uh, U.S. Naval Forces Central Command and uh, U.S. Uh, Fifth Fleet and Manama, Bahrain. Mm -hmm. um, there, uh, I was the Deputy uh, Assistant Chief of Staff for Logistics. Um, uh, Bahrain, the, the headquarters there, we basically, we had ships in shop to us from East Coast, West Coast, whether it's carriers, destroyers, cruisers, supply uh, ships in shop to us, and we had responsibility for their activities when they were over there in uh, the Persian Gulf. Um, so uh, we did participate in uh, Operation Desert Fox. Uh, well, what what was Desert Fox for the for the audience? For the uh, a actually, uh, uh, there there was several missions, Tomahawk firing missions into um, Iraq uh, sites in Iraq. There was uh, Tomahawk missions in. Uh, fired into uh, from our ships into uh, Afghanistan for the training bases that uh, Bin Laden was uh, uh, had under underway. We actually fired some Tomahawks into Sudan also uh, as part of that that effort for those the two years I was there. Yeah, and what years were these, Don? It was uh, 1997, 1999. Okay. Um, anything for, from the Bahrain, anything like really stand out, something dramatic or funny or scary, anything going on in, in Bahrain? Um, no, we actually uh, didn't have a lot of time off there. Uh, I think I probably could hit, uh, count on one hand the number of days I had off in two years. Wow. Uh, it was busy. Uh, but well, you said your, your your family was there too? Yeah, they were yeah. there with okay. me. Um, they went back to the States in the summertime. Yeah. Uh, spend time with uh, family. Sure. Um, uh, but I think one of the things that stands out <clears throat> most in my mind was in August of 1998. Uh, <clears throat> we had embassies in uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Yeah that were bombed. I remember that. That were bombed. Um, <clears throat> I was in charge of gearing up the logistics response to those bombings. Um, I was uh, on the phone with the U.S. Central Command or on the computer with them. I, I was, I didn't leave my office for a week. I had people go out and bring me food in because I was the, the, the focal point for getting the logistics to uh, um, and the recovery response for the, both those bombings. Yeah. And so I needed a lot of people, and I need a lot of help. Yeah. Um, there was a CB battalion deployed in uh, in Guam. Uh, I knew their capabilities. I sent the um, or orders out to get those guys uh, sent in to uh, um, help. Uh, I was with. Uh, Talking with Sixth Fleet and UCOM, European Command, sure. uh, getting some assistance from them. Um, it was it was a rough, rough time time frame, but um, I think we uh, uh, we reacted quickly uh, to the situation and uh, and with dignity to take care of those folks that were killed. They had to come out. Um, it, was, it was a rough t rough time for me. I, that's one thing I'll always, always remember. Did you personally go into Kenya or Tanzania, or was more recovery? Uh, I was. On the other I was end? directing it from Bahrain. Yeah. Uh, I had a uh, Navy lieutenant uh, that worked for me. Uh, that did go down there to be on site, and I comms back and forth sure. to him all day long. Mm -hmm. See what he. What, what do we need down there? What right. do we need? What do we need? And so, uh, so I, I didn't go on on site myself, but I, I did. You know, throughout that tour, though, I was in the theater. I was in Kuwait. I was in Saudi Arabia. I was in uh, the UAE. I was, you know, frequented. Well, as a commander, you're a pretty senior officer at, at this point. Yes. As well. Right. So. Right. I just uh, and 
1999, just before I left, I, I, I made captain. Oh, captain. Okay, so you're even more captain. senior. Yeah, very, a very senior yeah, officer I'm, at this point. I was yeah. promoted to captain in uh, June 1999. Okay. Okay. And then uh, maybe going backwards a little bit, I think from the notes you participated was um, in the Panama invasion as well? Yes. Yes. Yeah, tell us about uh, that, I'm please. Glad, you, glad you reminded me. Um, that was when I was with the, uh, the Seabees. Uh, Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 5. We were deployed to uh, Puerto Rico. We had detachments all over the Caribbean. Um, one of them was in Panama. And uh, uh, a small group of guys there, probably about 20, 20, 20 to 25 uh, CBs were there. And they couldn't tell us what they were doing, but they needed, they needed some help. They needed uh, repair parts for small arms. They needed uh, cleaning gear for small arms, which they didn't have. And so I chartered a, <clears throat> I chartered a C-12 out of uh, Puerto Rico. I loaded everything up that they asked for into the C-12. And I, I didn't fly it, but I was with, I flew with it to uh, Panama <clears throat> to deliver that, those much needed supplies for these yeah. guys, for my, my detachment. And uh, uh, as we're landing, that C-12 is landing, I see, oh, I'm looking outside the windows, and there's helicopters and there's airplanes and there's, there's, there's stuff everywhere. I said, what's going on here? And uh, we landed and uh, uh, took, the, took the stuff over to our, uh, our CBs and gave it to them. They were, oh, thanks. Thanks, supply officer. Uh, we, needed, we needed this stuff. And as it turns out, we didn't, I didn't know that the invasion was going to occur. But, but at, later, when I got back to, uh, got back to Puerto Rico, uh, I remember one night, probably about 10 o'clock at night, and all of a sudden, I mean, there was a, there was a SEAL detachment near us in Puerto Rico, near the base in Puerto Rico. And they're just firing weapons, and the sky's lighting up, and they're just yelling and screaming, and pop, 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 pop. These guys were, uh, I guess, getting motivated uh, to go to uh, Panama. Uh, they were highly motivated. And a few days later, the invasion occurred, and I found out that uh, the CBs that I had in Panama that I helped outfit were responsible for escorting prisoners of war across that bridge, the Bridge of the Panamas, I think it was, I, I don't recall right correctly, but that bridge that goes yeah. is in Panama. Yeah. Bridge of Americas, maybe? Bridge of Americas, yeah. 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 Bridge yeah. of Americas, yeah. okay. So my CBs were responsible for uh, per being armed escorts for taking uh, prisoners of war across that bridge to a holding location. Yeah. That's why they wanted all that stuff. Well, and it sounds like they paid you some pretty good compliments. Um, you know, supply guys maybe from my Army career too, the supply and some of the lo logistics are not always appreciated, but when they needed yeah. something, yeah. it sounds like you got it to them very quickly without I a did. lot of bureaucracy or nonsense, yeah. and, and that's yeah. what they needed. So. Yes, sir. It's a good, good compliment for you. Um, well, so then, these are just some kind of general questions from your Navy career, but specifically on okay. any of these combat-related deployments. Um, how were you able to stay in touch with folks, or even just on the submarine in general? How were you able to stay in touch with family and, and loved ones that were not with you uh, during these, these deployments? S su submarines were, that uh, was uh, difficult. Um, Basically, you had to wait till you got into port and uh, and, and use mail letters or receive letters. That was, that's it. That was the only way. Back then, we didn't have the internet. Well, and how does a submarine? Can you get this? Is a dumb, maybe a dumb question, but can you get mail at sea? You mentioned earlier about them in the Panama Canal. They were like throwing bales of mail. That was that was very unique that we had the opportunity to do that. Yeah, that's okay. the only time I've ever even seen it happen. Or heard of it happening on a submarine. Okay. Uh, so, so that's not the norm. Yeah. That's definitely not, okay. not the norm. Okay. Uh, that was about the only way I remember in, when I was with the Seabees. Uh, um, I used to, uh, again, it was mail. 
Uh, I, I may have gotten a phone call with my wife uh, maybe once mm -hmm. a week for a few minutes because it was pretty costly. But I remember uh, making recordings. Making right. recordings, uh, my, we had a one-year-old, or actually he was about two or three years old at the time, a son that he, he, he always, when I was home, he always used to want me to read before he went to bed. And so I took some books with me, uh, some of his books, and I read them uh, in, re in a recording and sent the tape back home yeah. to my wife so she could play it, play it for him. Yeah. So that was one, one way of trying to get yeah. around that, that problem. Yeah, that's a, I did and it that, worked. Yeah, I did that in Afghanistan. I would read the books and either get somebody to take pictures and film it or just the audio and, and then send right. it back. It works. It's wonderful. That's a good story. But, uh, you know, other than that... Um, do, I'm sorry, do, do, do you still have, does your son, do you guys still have any of those tapes? Maybe, maybe one or two. Yeah. Um, probably not likely, though. And how old is your son now? Uh, 34? Yeah. 34. That's, that's a good story. Yeah. Well, what about even then, uh, either on the submarine or w when you were in, on some of these deployments, what, what kind of things did you guys do? I know you were really busy and, and working all the time, but any downtime besides reading the books, were there things that you did with the other sailors or the other officers, like for recreation or yeah, a yeah, break? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> one thing that comes to mind is the uh, uh, when we were on the submarine, uh, we, we stopped into the Philippines a couple on a couple of occasions. And uh, we had uh, the wardroom. Wardroom is the officers uh, on board the ship. Periodically, we'd have uh, events. We'd go out in the countryside together and, and uh, uh, visit places. Uh, um, I remember one place we went to, um, it was actually kind of a sad situation. We're on a, like an open air jeepney. They call them jeepneys. Uh, going down into this valley and, and we did a little tour of a, a park area or whatever and then we're coming back up out of that valley coming back up out of the mountain and we're going back and forth in this jeepney and uh, we ran across a uh, an, another jeepney or a guy on the side of the road he was just you know kind of waving us down he was distraught so we stopped and to see uh, what was the cause of his uh, discomfort? And uh, he, he is just pointing, pointing off the side of the mountain. And so uh, some of the, a couple of guys, we didn't, not, not all of us, but a couple of them went down, because it, uh, it was pretty steep, walked down this mountain as careful as they could. And what had happened, uh, a, a civilian jeep, a Filipino uh, jeepney had actually tumbled off the uh, side of the mountain, and there's a lot of injuries, mm. and so we uh, th these probably ten or twelve of us officers, we 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 started a, a line, and, and the guy in the, and the, on the steepest side started handing oh like a human chain or something uh, right handing 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 uh, injured uh, uh, people up the mountain. I was at the top, and I was loading them. Into um, into our jeepney, and all these injured folks. They, they'd had some a little bit of first aid by the folks at the, at the beginning, and we we were able to actually help a lot of them. Wow, yeah. a lot of them. And we, actually, we had a dentist. Uh, he would just he just rode the submarine for <laughs> just a trip. He was a dentist we picked up in Hong Kong. He came to the Philippines with us, so he was on that. So he was actually the point man out there because of his medical training. Yeah. And it was really very fortunate we had him. So that was uh, that was an example of something of things that we did. But it, this one was a little bit sad. But we were able to help him. Well, I'm looking at your biographical information here. It looks like you received quite a few uh, prestigious and, and numerous awards and citations. So was there any any particular award that you got over your naval career that really stands out to you or has personal uh, extra meaning to you? Uh, Either a personal uh, one or a unit citation or something. Uh, the person, the personal ones. I mean, I didn't. 
I'm just acting with lobby for, for medals. I mean, I, 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 I did get some, and I'm very appreciative, appreciative of them. Um, I, I think they're a, a reflection of uh, the people I had around me more than uh, just myself specifically. Um, uh, but uh, we did get... Uh, On the submarine, we did get an award for, we, we, our, our missions were important, like I said before, um, and the submarine got a, an award uh, for its service. Uh, and there was a, we won a battle efficiency award with them, which okay. is hard to, hard to earn. Sure. Now, I think those, and, and actually in, this, in the uh, CB battalion I was with also, we also won a battle efficiency, which is the best CB battalion in, oh, wow. in the in the in the full force. Okay, and so I would think those battle efficiency awards at those two commands, the submarine and the CBs, uh, were uh, st they stand out in my mind because it was teamwork. We were efficient. We had good people, and uh, they're motivated. We perform well. Yeah, no, that's cool, and I, I like that the team effort, especially on a on a ship or a submarine. Where everybody's got to work together. There's no slackers or. Yep. That's good. Absolutely. Um, and again, over your your long career, promoted multiple times. Was there a uh, a certain promotion ceremony that was extra special? Um, there there was. Uh, um, it was when I got promoted to captain in Bahrain. Okay. Um, I had my family there. And actually, uh, the admiral I worked for. Uh, called uh, me and my family over to his office oh, wow. and uh, personally uh, promoted me and had a long talk with okay. all of us. He made it very special. He made it important. Um, uh, as Vice Admiral uh, Moore, and uh, I'll, I'll, we'll never forget that. That was just, uh, he, he handled that perfectly, the situation perfectly, that promotion. Yeah. And uh, he said, Don, I expect a lot out of you now. <laughs> yeah, I oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but but it was special because he 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 took the time. He's a busy man. Uh, we had a lot going on, but he 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 spent the time with me and my family to make it a special occasion. Yeah, and just just as I'm sure you remember that, I'm sure your family and yes. uh, That's, ch children they, they yes. remember that as well. Typically, hey. a promotion ceremony is uh, very you know you're in and out. Uh, you take the old boards off, you put the new ones on, and uh, he, he didn't, he, he made it special. Well, and, and then uh, I know you didn't retire right away after getting promoted, but, but tell us about your retirement ceremony. Uh, I retired, uh, the actual ceremony was in uh, June of 2003. My actual retirement date was in September 1st, so I had a lot of time after that. But, um, it, was, uh, it was at Cheetah Annex. At the same, uh, it was at the command that I told you about yeah. where we experienced 9 11. Um, we had a lot of a lot of people there. I had family come in from Ohio. Okay. A lot of family. Um, uh, it was a small conference room. We didn't have a lot of good facilities or, or you know standout facilities there, but we had probably a couple hundred people. Um, my Admiral uh, uh, Ryland Percy uh, did the uh, ceremony for us. We tried to keep it kind of low key, um, uh, but we had a, 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 a event afterwards. Uh, I catered in some barbecue and a keg of beer, and we had a had a good time. Um, and uh, uh, actually, had a friend from uh, high school come in. Okay. And, and he was actually my roommate in college too. Yeah. He came in out of, I drove down from uh, D.C. Uh, that was sp special to see everybody there on that. Really, yeah. my final, actually, final day in uniform. Now that's well, well deserved and well, well done, obviously. Um, well, how do you think your 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 tw twenty seven year naval career uh, has affected you? After you got out of the Navy, you know, looking back at the whole picture, the whole body of work, so to speak, uh, I got no regrets at all from service. 
I, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Uh, I, I miss the uh, I miss the people, most of all. Yeah. I miss the ones I I worked with. I miss those that worked for me, and I miss the ones that I worked uh, that I worked for. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I'm sure your experience is sim similar, and that uh, yeah. people make the people make the job, and uh, that's the one thing that I have missed. Um, I did go to work for a defense contractor after I retired and, and stayed there over 10 years. Um, and it's just, it's just, and there was a lot of uh, retired or uh, and veterans that worked with this defense contractor, but it's, it's just not quite the same. Right. The, the, the focus is not quite there. Um, uh, it's uh, the camaraderie. The uh, I, I don't know what the right terms are, but uh, it, that that close knit bond that you have it's, it's not quite the same and I, I do I still miss that it's, uh, it's a wonderful experience it was a privilege to uh, work uh, serve the, the nation um, but um, uh, uh, that's that's all I can say it's no, that's that yeah I, I, I totally understand well we're, we're kind of winding down towards the last question or two but yes, especially over a 27 year career and we jumped all around but was there any other areas that we hadn't talked about or anything uh, additional emphasis that you wanted to add I know you had a lot of notes and different things but um, um, let me think a second um, and well, I still have two more scripted questions for okay There was, uh, I, I know we didn't talk about this. I will talk about it just briefly. Um, I had an assignment in uh, California. It was with the, uh, at the Hughes Aircraft Plant. I was a uh, program, I can't call it a program officer, but uh, I was assigned there uh, in, the, in the plant Hughes Aircraft Plant to help oversee a big contract they had with the Navy uh, to build torpedoes. Mm. Uh, Mark 48 ADCAP torpedo. Uh, it was a remarkable experience, um, uh, primarily because I was trying to you know, all, all that, the, the camaraderie and the spirit and the motivation that we all experienced being in the military, I tried to bring a little bit of that to the Hughes Aircraft right. Plant. And I, I think, I, hopefully I was successful a little bit. Um, I tried to drum drum in the thought to them, to the employees, how important everything they did on a daily basis was. Yeah, because this is a largely civilian workforce. Yes, yes entirely, uh, entirely. I was, maybe, I was one of the few uniformed yeah in the plant of the you know 10,000 people that worked at Hughes yeah. Aircraft on different programs. But uh, having been on a submarine, I knew how important that that weapon was to the submarine force. And uh, I just tried to instill some of that sense of purpose to them yeah. uh, that, that, I, that we had. And, uh, we being uh, folks in uniform. And I think I was successful in that. Uh, they uh, actually, it was a full-scale engineering development program and it uh, um, they actually, they actually went into production a little bit earlier than they had forecasted. Uh, but it was a... Uh, well, and what, what year was this, you think? That was in, uh, excuse me for my... No, I, I have the same issues. That was in... Uh, February 86 to January 1988. Okay, so you were... I was a lieutenant. Yeah, still uh, early, almost early mid-career. Almost promoted, well, I was promoted to lieutenant commander uh, just prior to okay. uh, departing. Yeah. Okay, well then, um, the second to last question, the for of the formal question is, again, looking back on, on the, the broad picture, the big picture, um, what would be like the one message you would want 
grandchildren or, or great grandchildren, future generations, to know about you and your your, your military service? Um, I would just uh, say, uh, and I've thought about doing this at some point, uh, is writing something about uh, my service. But let them. I would just want them to know that I uh, I served. I served with uh, pride. Um, uh, serving in the military is a, a noble act, I think. Um, uh, it's with purpose. Uh, every day is with purpose. Um, and it's not for everybody. Uh, I mean, it's very, very few people in our nation actually serve. I don't know what the percentage is, but I know it's fairly fairly low, uh, but uh, I'd like my grandkids to appreciate those that do serve, have some appreciation um, and respect for those that do serve because this nation wouldn't be where it is without those folks in uniform every place that we serve, whether it's the continent of the United States, whether it's forward deployed, whether it's on a ship submarine and aircraft we would not be where we're at without without them and their service I, I agree 100 percent and that's that's really well said well that, so then Don as, as we wrap up and this has been a, a great interview great career that you've had a lot of a lot of good stories and and, and contributions a lot of, but a lot of memories yes yeah a lot of memories um, the final question is the catch-all is there, is there anything else you'd like to add or, or discuss um, Actually, uh, I, I, I would I would say uh, in a in a wrap up, um, twenty seven years went by really quick. Uh, like I said before, I, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Um, uh, I have uh, a lot of respect for. All our veterans everywhere. I mean, we're really close to Veterans Day, and what's Don Klein doing now? Uh, as he's retired from uh, the Navy and retired from uh, working, I'm I'm working a Veterans Day, volunteering to set up a Veterans Day ceremony a few miles up the road here for Veterans Day. Yeah. Um, so that's my one way of continuing to serve because I think it's important. Absolutely. Again, Don, Don, well said, and, and uh, that's part of the reason we're down here this Veterans Day weekend as well. I'm glad but, you are. Thank but you. But Don, if I could, while we're still on camera, I'd like to present you. I'm, I'm sure you guys are oh. familiar with the Challenge Coins. Yes, yes sir. Thank Maybe you. Maybe just hold that up to the camera real fast, too. Uh, I'm honored. Uh, that's our, our Voices of Freedom coin, and shake your hand on camera. Don, it's I been am a pleasure for me as well. That's a real honor, and I, I appreciate it very much. Thank you for your time, too.